Hi, I want to, uh, to do a little chat about the, uh, the standards check. My name is Bob Morton. Um, I'm on the audit register for parts one, two, and three. Uh, so, instructor trainer, I'm responsible for the um, induction delivery and all the uh, the uh, continued professional development for the driving centres. I've had 450 something people through our standards workshop, um, and we've based that on um, the examiner guidance. And it's producing us some fairly spectacular results. Uh, so I wanted to share what we know with you guys out here. Um, as there appears to be more and more people failing the standards check, so I don't know whether it's that they're just getting through more numbers, uh, but I'm noticing more and more and more on Facebook. Um, I also see some less than helpful advice. Uh, people will post that they're going on the standards check. Everybody says, ooh, good luck. And then when that person fails the standards check, Everybody seems to want to jump in and point the finger and say, well, you're a bit daft, you shouldn't have done this, you shouldn't have done that. Clearly, you're not fit for the job. So I wanted to produce this so that I can, I can perhaps help people who need it, and apologies if you don't, uh, to see what's required, uh, what it is that this standards check is all about. The advice that's been given is, is just do what you've always done. And that is true if you were already the kind of instructor who involved the learner to a high level, if you were this sort of person who was a, if you like, a facilitator of learning, you were able to effectively help someone learn. However, if you're a instruct, instruct, instruct kind of, kind of guy or gal, um, this test is going to find you out. Um, they're wanting client-centered approaches, they're closing the title, uh, they want the learner involved in all of these processes. So they want the standard stuff done, um, and it is still technically about your core comps, but more in a, in a client-centered way. If you, if you like, if you can think of it in terms of, so the core comps that you used on your part three exam, um, they're still present. However, they want the learner involved in the decision-making um, and the planning of what's going to go on to tackle those core comps. So whilst on the part three exam, the examiner would have said to the question, what do you think you can do to improve that? I don't know. This time, the learner driver is probably going to say, oh, well, we could maybe do a few of those, maybe a bit slower. Or could we try that in a different a different area with less traffic? So the learner is more able to be taking an interactive part, if you like. So I wanted to just have a, a, a brief overview of the standards check and, 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 and share my thoughts with you. And with a bit of luck, it'll help. Um, I'm training some people currently for standards check, and, and they've been given some less than helpful advice. Um, and naturally, especially if you've failed the standards check, you're going to worry like crazy um, about, oh my word, what do I do now? And when you're in that state, you'll seek advice from all over the place. Um, and some of the advice you get won't be necessarily good. There's also a tendency at that point to run around buying lots of books and spending fortunes on training. Um, I think the key thing, um, if you're yeah, preparing for the standards check, or B, you've failed the standards check, you need to know the standard by which you're being assessed. What you can then do is, um, if you like, take a snapshot of where you are now, compare what you're doing now with what it is that they want. That will help you to plot your journey from here where you are now to where you want to be. And you should be able to put in place some manageable steps along the way uh, and a method of um, assessing whether you're making progress or not, rather than you know, reading a particular book or thinking about changing the people you take or changing the lesson you take. Remember, it's all about you uh, and your client-centered approaches. So we should be able to adapt our lessons and adapt our teaching to suit whoever's next to us. Now, the part three exam, uh, which is what the old check test was based on, if you like, uh, is all about safety. The Register of Driving Instructors was created because it was felt that the standard of instruction that was being given nationwide wasn't good and back in the day we were killing tens of thousands of people on our roads it's not like it is now it's still bad but it's nowhere near as bad as it was so it's felt that instructors were giving unsafe instruction so the part three exam and the register of instructors was created to make sure that the instruction you give is safe fit for purpose and that you're going to eradicate the mistakes that are being displayed in role um, that if left unchecked would result in a dangerous driver um, we're now moving to a, a different model where we want to try and get the learner driver themselves to eradicate those methods, to find better ways of doing it, to discover things for themselves. And I suppose that's the, that's the main change, is that the learner is now expected to do more of the work. Well, I think the more enlightened ADIs, um, who are currently probably shouting at the screen, I've always done that, 
that's fine. But then do carry on doing what you're doing. But if you've been an instruct, 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 instruct kind of kind of API, then you need to ring the changes. So what's it all about? This new standards check. Uh, well, you'll get one standards check for every year or every cycle of your batch. That's in a four-year period. That's at least one standards check. You might get more depending on the grade you received. Um, if you get an A, they'll probably leave you alone for four years. If you get a B, probably going to see you after two years. If you get the low end of a B, uh, they might see you after a year. If you fail, they'll see you again in eight to 12 weeks. Uh, and you get three attempts at this. Um, you'll get the invite by letter, probably eight to 12 weeks ahead of time. Um, and that will invite you to a standard check at your local test center, the one that you normally use. Um, you can elect to have that standards check at any test center you wish. Um, you must attend. Um, if you are saying you can't attend, you must prove that you can't attend. Uh, they'll want a sick note or a, a letter to say that you're on holiday at that point or that you've got a test or they should be able to check that. Um, so if you can't attend, you'll need to let them know at your earliest opportunity. Don't sit on it. Let them know straight away. Uh, and if you're working with them, I'm sure they'll happily work with you to, to find a slot that's suitable to you both. Uh, but if you don't attend, you lose a life and you've only got three. So who do you take? Which pupil? Um, it's a tricky one. What I would say is take a pupil um, that you feel isn't going to let you down by cancelling on the day and that you feel works well with you, that you have a good rapport, that, that you're able to share the workload between you and that pupil responds well when you give them responsibility. Um, so as to which pupil you take, it, I suppose in theory it doesn't really matter because it's about you. Uh, but there's no point in taking uh, somebody who's going to crumble on the day because that's not going to do you any good at all. Uh, a lot of people take the, a family member or a friend uh, or perhaps uh, a trainee ADI. You can take a, a trainee ADI as long as they've not passed part two exam and you can do perhaps a higher level instruction, that kind of stuff. But we'll look at that a little bit later. But the pupil you need to take is one who responds to you, one who's, who responds well. The sort of lesson needs to be based on their needs. Um, don't try and rehearse too much because an examiner will smell it. Um, you can always tell when things are being planned out and that, that the pupil is giving preordained responses. Um, so find out what they want to do, how they want to do it, what level of help they want from you, uh, and put a plan together based on their needs, but also based on risk. Oh, I've used that word there for the first time. Um, people discuss the standards check and, and risk like it's something new. It very much isn't. Um, what we do has always been about risk. Uh, it's always been our job to manage the risk around us so that we keep our learner driver safe, all the people around them safe, us safe. And then we gradually transfer that responsibility for that risk to the learner driver so that once they pass the test, they're not going to be dangerous. There's nothing new here um, except that we want the learner driver informed of this. We want the learner driver to take an active part in this risk management. But the bottom line is, it all stays with you. It's not about saying to the learner, um, or it's not just about saying to the learner, of course, I've got dual controls, and if there's a risk, I will jump in and keep us from that risk. Uh, and what I want you to do is look out for risk, and I'll look out for risk. It's nothing to do with that. It's about active risk management, which is what our job's all about. We're keeping everybody safe. And we're gradually teaching or helping this person next to us to learn how to manage that risk on their own. Now that risk management isn't in just the risk management area of the standards check form, it's marked throughout. So if you're putting together a plan that's not really going to work terribly well and it's pushing the learner past the, the current level of ability, so that's in your lesson planning. If you're doing a bad job at that and you're pushing them too far, well then that's risky and your risk management will come down because of it. So it's a case of looking at it in terms of helping this person next year develop but having them involved in that level, in that, in, in a, at a high level in that development. Now, as they're coming through school now, they're exposed to coaching. So they know about taking responsibility for their own learning. So that plays into our hands. So the sort of lesson are one that's geared around their needs uh, and a one that suits their learning styles, if you want to call it that way. Uh, a, a lesson that works where learning has taken place. Uh, that's a phrase that used to be banded around a lot. Has learning taken place? Still the same. Um, has learning taken place in a safe environment? 
So is it different to what we do now? That depends on how you do the job now. Um, it shouldn't be if we're being effective. Modern day teaching is all about identifying and meeting learner needs. That's what it's all about. Making the lesson fit the learner, not making the learner fit the lesson. Now, it was possible under the old standards check to just deliver a preordained lesson and, you know, almost a one-way lecture and as long as we kept them safe. And you could almost conduct a, like a mock test and, and scrape a four. Um, this is very different. Um, there must be strategies in place to set out plans. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. This is the sort of area we're going to use. What sort of level of help do you want from me? And of course, adding in the stuff, which is, um, of course, I've got your back because I've got the dual controls here. If I feel I need to use them, well, I'll let you know. We'll have a chat just as normal. And then having strategies about how we're going to do it. What level of help do you want from me? Do you want me to talk you through it? Do you want to just have a go with me and keeping us safe? Um, or do you want me to demonstrate? Or so we're setting out the scene at the start. Uh, and then, of course, also, how will we measure whether we're being successful? Um, and if you've got your lesson planning right, uh, that takes care of your risk management. And it also takes care of your teaching and learning strategies because the learner is involved and you're putting together a plan that you both agree to that you know is going to work. So do you need to add anything to your existing game? That depends on who you are. Um, by reading the guidance, and I'm going to do some follow-up video to this about the three areas that you're marked on in a bit of detail about what they're looking for. Um, so you need to look at that and think, well, how am I being assessed? What is it the DVSA want me to do? What is it they're looking for? Their guidance also gives you an idea about what you shouldn't do. So by looking at that, you can measure what you're doing against what they want you to do, and that'll show you what sort of changes there needs to be. Um, that will then also inform you how you're going to go about or you know, how you're going to break that up and what skills you need to develop. Um, by identifying those and then by doing a reflective log, because you can practice all this stuff on your real learners, uh, by doing a reflective log each time, comparing what you're doing now with what they're expecting, you can plot your progress. What tends to happen is that uh, people who fail the standards check start rushing around like headless chickens looking for help and guidance, and they'll listen to anybody who's up there, like, happy to offer advice. And there is some seriously bad advice out there. So look at the DVSA's guidance. If you want to know what you need to do, there it is. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anybody's word for it. Look at what the DVSA want. That's how you're being assessed. Meet that criteria and an A will fall in your lap. Not meet that criteria, a fail could be coming. Um, if you fail, they'll come back to you in 8 to 12 weeks. If you fail that one, they'll take you off the register. So if you have failed, don't start running around thinking, oh, I need to take a different pupil or, oh, I need to take a different lesson. No, what you need to do is make changes to your current game that allow them to see you in a different light. Now, whether you think it's the right test or the wrong test doesn't matter. Um, the reality is you can sit on your principles and keep on doing it the way you've always done it and fail. Is that going to make you feel good? Probably not. So what we need to do is to look at where we are uh, and then look at where we need to be and then look at how we're going to achieve it. Um, hopefully with the, the other videos I'm going to do, it, it'll, it'll give you a bit of, bit of guidance because I'm basing it all around the, the DVSA's um, their, their document that they give to their examiners. This is what the form looks like. Uh, obviously at the top uh, is where your, your name goes and your number. Where the test is conducted, that's for at the end when the outcome. What the date is, does the vehicle have dual controls? What's the registration number? Do you currently have a valid certificate? Yes or no? Um, well, of course you can suspend your badge for a year as it comes to its end, so it may well be that you're renewing that way. Uh, and were you accompanied? QA, that means quality assurance. That's the examiner's boss sitting in watching him. You can have your trainer with you or other. You can take a friend uh, or a family member, but that person, just as on the L test, cannot take part in the lesson. What sort of people do you take? Well, either beginner, partly trained, trained, full license holder, new, or full license holder experience. So that would be a, the likes of your fleet customers. So you can take anybody you like, really, except a qualified ADI. Beneath that is the sort of lessons that they're, they're giving you again. Now, they've done every, everything except right on here, don't do a manoeuvre. Because they don't want you to do a manoeuvre, because that isn't really showing you managing risk and helping the learner to manage risk. You can recap a manoeuvre. Um, I was chatting to somebody today who was talking about the idea of taking a complete beginner and doing a controls lesson. 
well that doesn't show you managing risk at all and if you have a look at the form at the top here the lessons they're suggesting might be good ones are junctions town and city centre driving interacting with other road users that's a great one uh, dual carriageways faster moving roads defensive driving effective use of mirrors independent driving rural roads motorways eco safe driving or you can recap a manoeuvre, maybe do a session on commentary drive. That's a great one for anticipation and forward planning. Uh, recap an emergency stop, but there is a facility here for other. Uh, so you may go with something that's not on that list. Um, personally, my preferred option would be to take somebody that I was training for part two uh, and just operate at a higher level and just conduct the whole thing um, through questions, probing their knowledge and, and identifying how they're gonna manage what's happening ahead of them, if you like risk management. For example, you know, for a motorway, I'll say, okay, can you see the two wagons ahead? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the second wagon catching the first one? Oh, it is, yeah. What's your plan to deal with that? So that you're in there straight away to risk management. Um, and I'm doing it in a way that suits the learner because I'm asking questions I can't over-instruct. So they're the rough guidance to the lessons you can, you can have. You could choose something else, but they're making suggestions there. So I would perhaps suggest that you know, going with one of those might not be a bad idea. At the right hand side of the form at the top here is our competence levels beneath those things so you can see zero one two or three three is the maximum mark zero is the minimum so a zero would be no evidence of competence in that area uh, a one would be demonstrated in a few elements so you've kind of tipped your hat to it but you're not really doing much with it uh, a two is demonstrated in most elements, so uh, you're kind of nearly there, but there's still some holes. A three is, yeah, that's pretty satisfactory. You're, you're meeting that criteria. We should be aiming for threes all the time. And you're marked in three areas. The first one at the top here, lesson planning. Um, have you met or identified and met the, the, the pupils' learning goals and needs? Was the agreed lesson structure uh, appropriate? Were the practice area suitable? Well, of course, if you're taking somebody into an area that they're not really ready for, that's not a very good lesson plan and it impacts on risk management. Um, and was the lesson plan adapted when appropriate uh, to help the pupil work towards their learning goals? Um, things change, as you're all well aware, during a lesson. So what we need to do is to find somewhere to pull over if you can or do it on the move if the learner's capable of it and say, okay, this has happened now, whatever it happens to be. What are we going to do with that? Are we going to carry on with the original plan? Or do we need to adapt what we're doing? Uh, or this is not helping us get to where we need to be? Do we need to have a different route? Order? So we're really working live all the time to make sure that we're identifying and meeting the needs of the learner. If we're effective at that, that will also reduce the risk. It will also mean that our teaching and learning strategies are adapting to meet the needs of that pupil as well. So these things are all interlinked. They're not completely separate areas. Then, of course, you've got risk management, which is the one that everybody gets bent out of shape of it. Did the trainer fully ensure that people fully understood how the responsibility for risk would be shared? That's not a case of saying, right, on this session, I'm going to take care of 73% of this risk and 27% goes to you. Unless, of course, something goes wrong, then I'll take 80% of the risk and you'll take 20 and I'll jump in with my dual controls. And it's also not about saying, okay, you're a full license holder, so over to you. It's about having a discussion, setting the scene at the start. Okay, who's responsible for what? How's that going to pan out? Um, and it's it's important that you have this discussion at the start of every session not just for the standards check to be fair but for everything you do with learner drivers because we tend to just tell them about the dual controls at the start that we'll help them and then we tend not to men mention it again unless we have to use the jewels at the start of everything new any new activity okay I've got your back as normal you know I've got you covered so you've got nothing to worry about um, but in terms of what we're doing how much of this are you taking care of? How much is on me? Uh, and the idea is that, you know, at the beginning, I'm going to take responsibility for everything. And gradually, we'll transfer that over to you. Whatever it happens to be, you'll have a you'll have a system worked out between you and that learner probably before you get to start that check. But be sure and clarify that and mention it while the examiner sat in the back. Otherwise, he's, he's having a guess. Um, so with directions and instructions given to people in, uh, clear and in good time, I'm told by examiners that a lot of late instruction happens on standards check. Uh, was the trainer aware of the surroundings and the pupil's actions? Uh, again, I'm amazed to find out that <laughs> from time to time people fail the standards check because they weren't aware of what was around them. Uh, so it's it's you know staring at the pupil instead of taking on board the whole thing. Remember, you're responsible for risk, so you have to be alert to what's happening around. You can't switch off. Um, was verbal or physical intervention timely, and was it necessary uh, and appropriate? 
So what did you do when you did intervene, either with a prompt or a command or a, a use of a control? Um, and then the critical one, and this is the most important line on this on this on this area, was sufficient feedback given to help the people understand any potential safety critical incidents. Has a conversation happened about what have we learned from that? What would we do different next time? How will we, ma if you like, manage the risk the next time we encounter that situation? What are we going to do? What's the plan, man? And then the final bit, which is teaching and learning strategies. In reality, if you get your lesson planning right, this should work. Was the teaching style suited to the pupil's learning style and current ability? Well, if you've got your lesson plan right, of course that's got to work. Was the pupil encouraged to analyze problems and take responsibility for their learning? These are the big changes. And these are the areas, those top two and then these ones here, um, where a traditional, if you like, for want of a better word, instructor falls down because we've been used to doing all the thinking, all the planning. Um, so if you carry on doing that, you're going to score low in these areas, uh, which actually increases the risk, which means there's a danger you'll fail for having seven or less in the risk management. Um, was the people encouraged to analyze problems and take responsibility for their own, learn own learning? Okay, what have we learned from that? Tell me about that. Analyze that for me. Tell me what that grey car was doing. How did that impact on us? What could we do different in that situation next time? Um, and were opportunities and examples used to clarify learning outcomes? So, you know, well, it's as simple as that. What have we learned from that? How does that link to what we, were, we said we were going to do today? How does that fit into the bigger picture? Um, and were opportun uh, sorry, was the technical information given comprehensive and accurate? And again, I'm told by examiners that sometimes the information that's given on standards check isn't right. If you're not sure, please reach for the highway code or driving the essential skills. Don't make something up. Um, and this is a, a key one. Was the pupil given appropriate and timely feedback during the session? I tend to not like to think about it, but, but it is giving feedback. But has a conversation happened uh, to verify that learning has taken place or to help them to learn something new or to help them develop a different pattern of behavior? So it's a conversation, not feedback, because that indicates just one way. Um, again, were the pupil's queries followed up and answered? It may well be. Your, your pupil asks you a really smart question. You're thinking, oh, I don't know. If that is the case, just say, you know what? That's a great question. I don't know. Let's look it up. Or put a plan in place. I'm not sure about that. I'll come back to you with an answer on that on the next lesson. Um, did the trainer maintain an appropriate, non-discriminatory manner throughout the session? Well, of course, we shouldn't be... Um, judging people based on race, creed, colour, religion, sex, uh, age, or any, any of the protected items in the, in the Equality Act. But we should, basically, it, it, it says, behave like a professional. Uh, I'm told by examiners that <laughs> conversations happen on standards check about the pupil's personal life or about the instructor's personal life. That can't happen. That should never happen on a driving lesson. You're a professional driving instructor. You're not a marriage guidance counsellor, you're not their friend. Um, you are a professional driving instructor, so act in a professional manner. If you want to see how you should behave there, look at the DVSA's code of conduct. That's how they want you to behave. And again, another big one. Um, the last one on the form at the end of the session was the pupil encouraged to reflect on their own performance. Not us telling them how well they've done, but okay, at the start of today's session, we said this is what we're going to do. This is why it's important at the start of a session to say, how will we measure whether we're being successful? And that's what this conversation is about now. Did we manage what we said we we're going to manage? Now, you don't always have to wait till the end. Pull up regularly for a performance review. Okay, we said we were working on this. How's that working for you? Um, and get used to using phrases like pulling them over and just saying, analyze the last five minutes for me. Tell me what went on there. In light of what we're working on today, has that met that criteria? Are we working towards that? If we're not making way towards that, what can we do about that? Can we change the lesson plan? Can we change the teaching style? Can we change the route? Do we need to change the subject because we're maybe feeling a bit tired today? So we've got to be lively and alive to and alert to what the learner's needs are at all times. So here's the form at the top, as you can see these three columns here. Now, we're looking for threes in each of those. Um, if we don't get a three, um, if we've had a test and we haven't got a three, that's an area that we, we need to identify that we need to aim for a three. Looking at the guidance will help you to see what do I need to do differently. And that's the key thing. If you fail the standards check, you have to do something differently. 
Um, you can mourn about the DVSA, and you can mourn about the new test, and you can mourn that um, it isn't fair because I was tested on the core comps and now I've got this. And yeah, you're probably right. You know, that is probably a genuine gripe. And, but ask yourself this question. Energy that you devote to that, is that helping you get the result next time? Um, and it's, I don't want to sound harsh, but it's very difficult to see the clear path forward with the back of your hand on your forehead. What you need to do is to look at what you need to do and put a plan in place to fix it. Ignore anything else, because what you've got to do is you've got to perform in a different way next time. You have to fulfill your potential. And the reality is your potential is your performance at any given moment minus interference. Uh, something I learned from our friend Tim Galway in his book, The Inner Game of Tennis. And interference comes in many forms. That's one of them. Unable to see. Um, worry about the test. Fear of the test. Fear of failure. Um, and voices from all over the place offering you a thousand and one different pieces of advice. That's all interference. What you've got to do is you've got to try and clear all that away. Uh, and see the light at the end of the tunnel, another cliche. Uh, and the only way you're going to do that is look at the guidance that the DVSA give, look at what they're looking for, have a look at, an honest look at, are you doing that now? Um, if you're not, seek help. But seek help from somebody who knows what they're doing. And I don't wish to be disrespectful of anybody, but somebody who's posting on Facebook who's already failed two standards checks is not the place to look for, for guidance on how to get through your next standards check. Um, talking to somebody who has passed the standards check is perhaps marginally better but again it may well be that they've done that and they still don't really fully understand what the criteria is you need the help of somebody who understands the criteria best place to go the examiner who filled your standards check to see if you can get a word with them uh, outside of that read the guidance um, look for uh, some impartial guidance um, Somebody who can help you to get to where you need to be. There's an argument that says, you know, if you went to a coach, not a driving coach, but say a business coach, somebody who knew nothing about driver training and you showed them the criteria, uh, in fact, maybe they wouldn't even need that. If you let them know where you need to be, they can be very helpful at getting you where you want to be. Because it's not about what I think what you, or what anybody else thinks. It's about how you see it and the changes that you're prepared, prepared to make. Uh, that's a little bit of a deep conversation for, the, for this, this little piece of video. But I just wanted to, to put some ideas out there and let you know what, what the thing's all about. Um, so that ends that little bit there. I'm going to do some more videos that, that go into a, a great deal of detail about what it is the DVSA want and what you can do to, to hopefully make that happen. So I hope that's been useful to you. Um, if it has, great. Job done. Um, if you feel you want some extra help, I am happy to, to help people in, in terms of one-to-one -one training. Um, but there's a lot of information out there that you can help yourself. Um, don't throw a ton of money at training. Have a training session. Work out where you are following that training session and put a plan together. 90% of the changes that need to happen, you can be working on with your learner drivers. Uh, it's just a case of knowing what you need to change. So don't spend thousands of pounds just on being retrained. Um, get the ideas in place. Formulate some clear goals. This is what I want to work on. This is what I want from the, at the end of it. And then put some stepping stones in between. Uh, you don't have to be trained by somebody else all along that path. You can do a lot of that yourself. Um, so hopefully that's been useful. If it has, great. If it hasn't, then I'm sorry for wasting your time. Uh, and I'll look forward to speaking to you soon.